Well, thank you for doing it. I uh, very much appreciate it. Um, the study of existential risks, the factors that may contribute to humanity's near or total extinction has become quite a preoccupation for you. Um, you've written about it before. Many of these risks have always been present, volcanoes, earthquakes, etc. Others around for a long time, pollution, nuclear weapons, some are more recent. Why 2011 for the start of CSER? I think there are two things that have changed over recent decades. Uh, the first is that the main threats that concern us now no longer come from nature. They no longer come from uh, um, asteroids, earthquakes, etc. but they are caused by human actions. So we have entered a new era, uh, which people call the Anthropocene, where the future of our planet depends more on what we do collectively and individually than on nature itself. And of course, the first manifestation of this was probably the nuclear age, uh, when during the Cold War, we could have stumbled by uh, miscalculation or design into a real Armageddon with tens of thousands of nuclear weapons going off. Um, that was the first case when we could cause more damage than anything in nature. And so I think we are now in a situation where we are threatened by the downsides of our own technologies. And another thing has changed. We are in a global interconnected world. So it's unlikely that a major part of the world could suffer devastation without it impacting on the rest of the world. It's not like in earlier centuries when there could have been a localized disaster in one region which completely unaffected the rest of the world. So we are more interconnected and we are more vulnerable. E.O. Wilson has, has spoken of, of us tearing down the biosphere and saying it's, it's going to be forever if we don't do something rather urgently. You, you've also highlighted the biosphere. Mm -hmm. Is that the most critical risk that you see? I think it's something we have a special responsibility for um, because, uh, uh, as E.O. Wilson himself said, uh, if human actions lead to mass extinctions, it's the sin that future generations will least forgive us for. That's because it will be an irreversible loss of biodiversity. Um, and, uh, uh, of course, it's an ethical question how much you care about that. And I think it's rather interesting that the uh, Catholic Church has come out straight in the papal encyclical of uh, uh, 2015 uh, that humans have a responsibility to the rest of the environment. Uh, they were, uh, except for the Franciscans, rather shifty on that, talk about man having dominion over nature, etc. Whereas for the first time, the Church itself has said that we have an obligation to the rest of the natural world. And, uh, of course, uh, many environmentalists think that the natural world has value over and above what it means for us humans, but of course it doesn't mean a lot for us humans in that if fish stocks dwindle to extinction or if uh, we cut down the rainforests, we may lose benefits to humans. But it's more than that. We should surely regard the preservation of biodiversity as an ethical imperative in its own right. Let me ask you about Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon wrote a, there's a famous book, New Atlantis, mm -hmm which was uh, describing a scientific utopia. Mm -hmm. I wonder what he would make of the Anthropocene. Has science failed in that regard? And if it has, where did it go wrong? I certainly wouldn't say science has failed. I think uh, uh, the lives we all live are far better than those lived by any previous generation. And we certainly couldn't provide any kind of life for the 7.3 billion people now on this planet without the advances of technology. So I think it's the technology based on science which allows us to live the lives we do. And I think what we need to be mindful of is that uh, as we take advantage of these benefits, there are also downsides. The stakes are getting higher. Uh, we have greater empowerment and this can lead to the benefits that we all enjoy. And the challenge for the coming decades is to uh, harness the benefits of the exciting new developments in uh, particular biotech and in artificial intelligence and avoid the downsides. I know you've uh, highlighted AI as, as perhaps uh, an important way forward. Um, how do you see AI contributing to this um, better future? Well, uh, uh, let me say I think the biggest concern I have is about biotech, 
but uh, of course uh, uh, we have benefited hugely from information technology. Uh, the fact that someone in the middle of Africa has access to the world's information and we are all in uh, contact with each other is a wonderful thing. And frankly, the only reason why the average blue collar worker is better off that now than 20 years ago is because of information technology. Otherwise, they're worse off in capitalist societies, in my opinion. Um, so it's been a huge benefit. Um, and uh, of course, information technology um, does allow us to uh, uh, organize large systems better. But of course, it does raise uh, new concerns about uh, uh, privacy and, uh, uh, and individuality. So I think this is a new set of challenges we have to cope with. And of course, if we look further ahead, um, we wonder about whether the um, AI will achieve anything approaching human intelligence, and that raises a whole new set of questions. But before we get to that stage, of course, uh, we are um, having a big revolution in the labor market because machines and robots are taking over more and more segments. And of course, it's not just uh, factory work they're taking over. They're taking over many um, professional jobs. I mean, routine accountancy, uh, medical diagnostics and surgery, and um, uh, legal work will be taken over. And ironically, um, some of the hardest jobs to automate are things like plumbing and gardening. There'll be scope for that. Uh, but I think the important message, which I would draw from this is that in order to provide a, a decent society in the light of these developments, we've got to have massive redistribution of wealth so that the money, as it were, earned by the robots is used to fund huge numbers of dignified, well-paid, secure posts for carers for young and old and uh, people in public sector jobs of that kind. So we need massive socialist redistribution. You founded CSER. I think you say CESER, do you know? <laughs> right, uh, yes. Someone said that mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Get an interesting uh, mm -hmm. pronunciation. Uh, to, f to find solutions for the planet. Uh, yet it might be said that your academic career has been otherworldly. Mm -hmm. uh, what's a cosmologist doing worrying about things on Earth? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, my professional interest has been in cosmology, of course, um, but I've been involved over the last 30 years to an increasing extent in more practical issues. I mean, I was quite involved in uh, nuclear disarmament and the Pugwash Conference movement in the 1980s and wrote quite a bit about that. And then uh, about uh, 15 years ago, I wrote a book called Our Final Century, uh, where I uh, addressed not only the nuclear threat, but also some of these environmental threats. And I think in a more distinctive way at the time, highlighted the dangers that are going to arise from the growing empowerment of individuals and small groups by new technologies, in particular bio and cyber. And so that was uh, my interest. And that book, although it didn't sell very well, it had quite a big influence on a lot of people. And uh, that led to a growing interest and uh, more articles on this and uh, then uh, an opportunity arose for a few of us um, in uh, 2011 to set up a small research center based in Cambridge University but with international advisors to try and address some of these uh, extreme uh, threats and the reason for doing this really is that there's a huge amount of effort going into discussing small risks like carcinogens in food low radiation doses, train crashes, air crashes, and things like that. Uh, whereas people are almost in denial about these low probability, but very high consequence threats which stem from new technology. Um, possible events that could be so catastrophic that even one occurrence is too many. And so what we felt was it was worth at least having a few people who were engaged in thinking a bit more deeply about some of these, so as to decide which of these potential threats can be dismissed as science fiction and which are sufficiently credible that they are worth some attention to actually uh, uh, see how we can guard against them and uh, have the benefits of technology with a minimum risk of these downsides um, and uh, how we can, in a university like ours, use our convening power to draw together some experts who can address which of these threats are real and how we can minimize those that are most concerning. Uh, how do you go from what you do as academics mm -hmm. to what becomes policy in these areas? It's a serious issue for any um, academic how the findings can be fed into policy when they're relevant. 
Of course, uh, um, there are some uh, um, scientists who are government advisors. They often have a rather frustrating time, and that's because for politicians, the focus is obviously the, uh, the local um, and the immediate, and what happened before the next election, whereas these uh, concerns are long-term and often global, and they tend to drop down the agenda. Uh, so it's quite hard to uh, uh, keep these in the forefront of politicians' minds. And of course, scientists have to be fully aware that they are specialists, and they can uh, ensure that politicians have a good understanding of the scientific basis, insofar as anyone understands it, of all these potential uh, threats. But they have to bear in mind that any policy decision which politicians make is based not just on scientific instances, but also involves ethics, economics, and politics as well. And in those latter areas, scientists have no particular expertise, and they should be aware of that. And I think it's very important, uh, and I see this myself as a campaigning scientist, to distinguish when I'm speaking as an expert and when I'm speaking as a concerned campaigning citizen. I just wonder whether the United Nations doesn't, uh, s at some point, uh, become an agency that you interface with. And well, some of the UN agencies are important, and I think one of the issues which I think uh, should be addressed by politicians is whether we need more agencies, rather like the WHO or the IAEA, or whether we need to beef them up, because obviously uh, there are issues like pandemics, which the WHO has to deal with, and issues of nuclear safety and all the rest. And I think, uh, quite apart from the concerns of catastrophic risks, there are global issues like um, uh, global energy policy, where it would help to have more international uh, contacts and collaboration. So whether it's actually under the UN or a standalone institution, I think there is certainly more need now to have um, uh, global or at least multinational um, bodies which can actually coordinate policy on these issues which are agreed by everyone to be important, but which are hard to address because they are um, international and they are very long term. And of course, it's very hard for people to think long term. I mean, in planning um, uh, to uh, avoid catastrophic climate change, um, we are uh, being asked to make an insurance premium payment now for the benefit of people in remote parts of the world 50 or 100 years in the future. And that's a pretty hard sell for people. And that's uh, a reason why it's been hard to do this. But we do need to try and persuade people to think globally um, and longer term. Ironically, there's only one context where public policy is very long term. And that's in the disposal of radioactive waste. When people talk with a straight face about whether the repository, be it Yucca Mountain in the US or the much more effective one in Finland, are safe for 10,000 years. And it's rather ironic they talk about a 10,000-year horizon there when no nation can plan its energy policy sensibly even 30 years ahead. You've made the statement that we have a 50-50 chance of making it to the end of this century. Um, what's the basis for that calculation? Well, we can't really calculate these, but I would certainly say that we have at least a 50% risk of experiencing a very severe setback to our civilization between now and the end of the 21st century. Um, and uh, this will be due to the uh, collective pressures of nine or 10 billion people on the planet, or I think more likely um, disruption stemming from the misuse of these ever more powerful technologies by small groups. Yeah. By error or by design. Part of the subtitle in the US of your book was Terror, Error, and Environmental Disaster. Mm -hmm. and some people would say that sounds like doomsdays, uh, doomsday saying. Well, I mean, any of those would be, a pretty, would be disasters, wouldn't they? I mean, a mass extinction or um, uh, changes to the environment which, uh, um, cause, um, uh, which cause reductions in fertility in parts of the world. All those things could be disastrous. But I sense that you're optimistic, though. Even, even though we go 50%, uh, it sounds to me in, uh, in your writings that you're in fact optimistic. Well, I mean, uh, uh, I, I'm a technical optimist but a political pessimist. 
in that I think uh, uh, the um, uh, advances of technology and science um, are hugely beneficial and uh, we won't get through the century by uh, not uh, using them. Um, we mustn't take the precautionary principle too far. We must accept there is a hidden cost of saying, no, we've got to develop these technologies. But we've got to realise that as they get more powerful, uh, they have uh, bigger downsides. And in particular, they have the uh, feature that they enable small groups of people, even individuals, to have a global impact. And as I like to say, the global village will have its village idiots and their idiocies will have global range. And this is something new. And I think it's going to be a new challenge to governance to ensure that uh, we can uh, um, balance the tension between privacy, security and liberty uh, when uh, a few people can cause such catastrophic global damage. So th that's the sort of risk which we uh, are up against uh, caused by a few people, which has to be added to the kind of risks which are caused by our collective impact on the planet. One writer who, who's also written about existential risks um, has, a, a, towards the end of the list, he has self-delusion as um, a serious problem. Um, that seems to be dependent really on the problem of human nature, uh, an aspect of human nature. I wonder what you say to that. I'm not quite sure exactly what is meant by self-delusion in this context. I think he means... Um, the way that our minds will um, set things up so that we will see them positively. Um, we will say things like, in the face of existential risks of other kinds, well, science will always solve it. Don't need, I don't need to worry about it. Yes. We're deluding ourselves in that respect. Y yes. Well, well, I think it is certainly true that we are in denial about things that ought to concern us, um, especially um, these uh, risks which could be so catastrophic that one occurrence is too many. And I think that is uh, a concern. Um, and also there's a feeling of helplessness on the part of individuals. They don't know what they can do. And that's why I think it is very important uh, that uh, uh, we should bang on to our politicians about this. And incidentally, uh, because it's hard for politicians to uh, focus on a long-term global issue uh, in the pressure of short-term concerns, um, I think it's very important that the public should be aware of this because politicians um, are influenced by what's in the press and what's in their inbox. So I think as scientists we have a responsibility to ensure that the uh, best scientific ideas are fed into the political process um, but I think we can do this not only by advising politicians if we get the chance to do so but also by um, going public and campaigning so that the public are aware of this. And, uh, uh, and then we have a, a big uh, leverage. And to take one example of this, um, the um, papal encyclical in 2015, um, which was uh, triggered, in a sense, by uh, academic um, discussions within the papal academy um, as, and by other inputs, that, of course, had huge leverage um, on uh, um, the billion um, members of the church, because whatever one thinks about the Catholic Church, and of course I'm deeply ambivalent about it, uh, there's no denying its, uh, um, its long-term vision, um, its uh, concern for the world's poor, um, and uh, uh, its global nature. And in that, that respect, the Pope's influence was extremely effective. He got a standing ovation at the UN, and I think the uh, agreement for what it was worth at the Paris conference in December 2015, would not have been achieved had it not been for the uh, effect of the papal encyclical, in particular in Latin America, Africa and East Asia. Not in the American Republican Party, I don't think. When it comes to solutions to X risks, you and your colleagues have focused on bringing together the best of physics, computer science, philosophy. I was interested that philosophy was part of it. Because hard and applied science don't, don't usually go there. Mm -hmm. um, the focus is understandable when we are talking about nuclear, biological weapons, climate change. But what about um, pride? What about human pride? How, how, do, how do we deal with that as an existential problem? Well, I think uh, uh, we, we need uh, social science and humanistic understanding, obviously, um, as well as um, uh, understanding the 
physical and biological sciences. And um, to give a, a simple example, which is uh, 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 an issue of anyone concerned with the threats of disasters, um, uh, does the fact that everyone in even a mega city in the developing world has mobile phones, does that make a potential pandemic even worse or does it make it better? Because mobile phones can spread panic and rumour, they can also spread good advice. And that's an example where uh, social science needs to be used to see how we can uh, minimise the effect of some disaster. And to take another issue which concerns me very much, um, if there were a pandemic, and I think about natural pandemics, then um, I worry that even if the casualty rate was only one in a thousand, point one percent, that could lead to social breakdown, because that would overwhelm hospitals. And whereas in the Middle Ages, everyone was fatalistic, a third of the population died, the rest went on as before. Once the capacity of hospitals is overwhelmed, certainly in the United States, I think there could be se severe social breakdown. And so that's the kind of thing that you have to worry about. And that's a, a social sciences issue, of course. H.G. Wells uh, said there's, there's no way back into the past. It's the universe or nothing. <laughs> that's the choice, the universe or nothing. I wonder whether you would agree with that and if you would speak to how we get past the existential bottleneck you've raised. Well, uh, I, I don't have any solutions. Um, I, I think we can understand these better, but I do think we're going to have a bumpy ride through this century. Um, and uh, I don't really uh, see any easy way out. Uh, because some people say that uh, um, m maybe H.G. Wells was thinking this, that we can go and have new colonies in space and all that. Um, I have thought quite a lot about uh, um, the long-term future of the human species. Um, and uh, uh, I think this is exciting and important. Um, I think uh, what's going to happen is that we are going to be able to modify human beings by cyborg techniques and by gene editing techniques. And in effect, redesign human beings. I think we are going to try to regulate all these technologies um, by, uh, uh, on grounds of um, prudence and ethics. But I think we'd be ineffective in regulating them because I think that whatever can be done will be done somewhere by someone. It's not like 40 years ago when the first scientist to do um, common of DNA met in a cinema to decide guidelines on what experiments to do. They, they were f academic scientists and they agreed moratoria and observed it. But now the enterprise is global with strong commercial pressures. And to actually control the use of these new technologies is, I think, as hopeless as global control of, of the drug laws or the tax laws. So I'm very pessimistic about that. Um, uh, we can obviously try and minimize them. But I think to uh, take a, a rather uh, more positive view, looking beyond the Earth. Um, some people talk about um, uh, whether humans are going to spread beyond the Earth to Mars or elsewhere. Um, I'm not a great fan for manned spaceflight because the practical case is getting weaker as the robots get better because whatever we think of the roles of robots on Earth, then certainly in the hostile environment of space, robotic fabricators, etc., and explorers are going to be the way we will actually build things and explore. Um, so if people go into space, it'll only be as an uh, adventure, in the same way as people uh, go to the South Pole or climb Everest. It'll be an adventure, um, and it's a dangerous delusion to think that there'll ever be uh, a community on Mars escaping from the Earth's problems. There's no planet B, as it were. But there will, I think, by the end of a century, be a small community of um, uh, eccentric pioneers living probably on Mars. And they will be um, away from any regulations we impose on Earth regarding cyborg and uh, um, biotechniques. And moreover, they'll have every possible incentive to adapt their progeny to this very hostile environment, which humans aren't at all adapted to. And so post-human evolution will, in my view, start away from the Earth 
triggered by uh, these uh, communities who will uh, be out there and they will um, try to adapt themselves. And so uh, the post-human evolution is going to start out there, in my opinion. And, um, of course, the other thing which is important to astronomers is the realization that the time lying ahead is literally billions of years. So we humans are not the culmination of evolution. We're not even the halfway stage because the time ahead is longer. And moreover, future evolution is going to take place not on the slow time of Darwinian selection, where it takes about a million years for species to emerge and evolve, but on the technological time scale, where um, by design, uh, humans are adapted or new species designed. And so future evolution far beyond the Earth is going to happen much, much faster. And uh, we can't conceive what will happen because this may involve intelligences beyond what the human brain can ever encompass. We've no idea what will happen. But I think that that's going to happen uh, triggered by small groups of rather crazy pioneers away from the Earth who aren't subject to the kind of regulations which I think we all want to impose here on Earth. Will they take their human nature with them, I wonder? Well, of course, it's, it's interesting to ask how malleable human nature is. I mean, human nature is clearly very malleable. It's hard for us to understand the attitudes and concerns of many uh, uh, earlier generations. And uh, so the human nature may, may indeed change. Um, and let's hope it changes in a way that uh, allows um, uh, a cooperative society to develop. But in the very long run, of course, uh, if we read our science fiction, we realize that perhaps uh, what we will have is not a civilization, but some single huge mind. And even H.G. Wells thought about that. After Hi Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, Einstein famously said, it's easier to denature plutonium than it is to denature the evil spirit of man. Wh what do we do, and you've hinted at it already, uh, what do we do to, exchange, uh, uh, to change the existential risks associated with human nature? I think it's very hard. We, we obviously uh, uh, have concerns uh, which uh, stem from religious extremism, for instance, in particular at the moment. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and one, one can hope that, uh, that, that that will eventually be eroded, although I see few signs of it. Um, and I think also uh, it's incumbent on politicians to foster a society which minimizes the number of opportunities and occasions for legitimate grievance, because obviously um, a disaffected minority um, is going to be in a more empowered position in future because of advanced technology than in the past. So I think there's an even stronger incentive to have the kind of um, a fairer and more equal society which many of us want anyway, um, because uh, otherwise there'll be a much greater chance of severe disruptions. One of your books centers on the six numbers, mm -hmm. uh, define the conditions, some would say for human life on Earth, chicken and egg, I, yeah, I suppose, yeah. here. Mm -hmm. The anthropic principle. Mm -hmm. Now you're addressing the pros and cons of the Anthropocene, Anthropocene, <laughs> the age when humanity is the dominant influence. What's the relation between the two, if there is one? Well, uh, I think uh, um, we are the outcome of four billion years of evolution here on Earth, um, and uh, this is the outcome of uh, complicated processes, lots of contingencies. Um, and a question which we astronomers ask is whether there is life, even life like us, elsewhere, because we've made the important discovery, mainly in the last 10 years, that most of the stars we see in the sky are orbited by retinues of planets, just like the uh, sun is orbited by the Earth and the other familiar planets. This makes the universe far more interesting and raises the question of uh, how important is life in the universe. We understand the evolution from simple life to our present biosphere. We still don't understand the transition from complex chemistry to the first replicating, metabolizing systems we call alive. We don't understand that yet. Uh, but for the first time, serious people are working on it. it was be, it's one of these problems which has been put in the sort of too difficult box. Uh, but now people think they can make progress. And I hope that within 10 years we'll understand that. 
And also within 10 years, we will have good enough observations of some of these Earth-like planets orbiting other stars to have some idea of whether they have biospheres or not. So we will learn about how widespread some kind of life is in the universe, I think within 10 or 20 years. And that then, of course, raises a separate question. Is there any intelligent or advanced life? Because uh, there's a big difference between saying there's some sort of uh, biosphere and saying there's some sort of uh, intelligent technological life. And that, of course, uh, uh, we understand the emergence of far less, and so we can't place betting odds. But there are some people who think it's worth looking for signs of something which is manifestly artificial out there, because it would be, of course, um, uh, a huge discovery if we could uh, detect something artificial which would indicate that uh, concepts of logic and physics weren't unique to the sort of wet hardware in human skulls, but it evolved somewhere else. So that's... Uh, uh, true. And of course, we are in this enormous universe where there are 100 billion galaxies, each with 100 billion stars, and many of those stars will have Earth-like planets around them. And uh, we understand um, that this um, uh, huge domain um, is uh, governed by the basic laws of physics we can understand, and also uh, by uh, laws which seem to be the same everywhere we can observe. Um, we, if we take the spectrum of light from a distant galaxy, uh, we can infer that the atoms in it are just like the atoms here on Earth. The force of gravity is the same. Of course, if the observing the universe is quite anarchic, it wouldn't make any sense of it. But the fact that we've been able to make sense and have a, uh, a fairly convincing um, uh, model for how our universe evolved over 13.8 billion years from a hot, dense beginning to its present structure, um, that's, I think, one of the great achievements of science in the last 50 years and also is um, uh, uh, something which uh, um, was only possible because the, the laws are universal. But these have led to another uh, development uh, which might be yet another Copernican revolution because uh, there's no reason to think that the um, uh, observable universe, vast though it is, is the entirety of physical reality. And so there's a possibility that uh, there's a lot more um, space beyond what we can see, space from which light has not had time to reach us, and also the possibility that our Big Bang wasn't the only one. And even though the laws of physics are universal and the same within the region we can observe, then if that vast region is only a tiny part of physical reality, then it remains open to envisage that different parts of uh, this grander physical reality are governed by different physical laws. And we don't know at all. There are some theories which suggest this, some which don't. Uh, this is very speculative. But just as 50 years ago we didn't know if there was a Big Bang at all, now we can define it quite precisely back to a nanosecond. I would hope that in 50 years' time we might be able to address questions like uh, does physical reality involve just one Big Bang or many, and does it involve domains where the physical laws are different from what they are here. What is it, what do we say, the, the unknown unknowns? Absolutely, yes. Mm. We're, in, we're into that realm, beyond mm. the yes. 92 billion light years right. across. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes, well, of, co of course, but, but it's the nature of science. I mean, I mean uh, I've been at this for more than 40 years, and many of the issues which were uh, being addressed and respected when I started have now been settled, and the questions we are now posing couldn't even have been posed back 40 years ago. So that's the, that's the nature of science. We go to the other uh, end of this and talk about the Large Hadron Collider. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you said is that, you know, it could tear uh, the fabric of space apart. And, and um, here we are 10 years later, I think when you said that, a little more. Um, what do you, would you say the same thing today? Uh, they've had a lot of success in what they've done. Um, well, I, I, I don't think anyone expected that it would have any catastrophic consequences. But I think there was a sort of non-trivial issue um, in that um, even if you thought there was a one chance in a hundred billion of some catastrophe, then that would have been enough to uh, urge caution. Um, and uh, uh, there was a genuine debate about whether we could be sufficiently confident at that level. And uh, 
and I think there was a serious debate. I think uh, it's clear that uh, there wasn't this concern and there were a lot of arguments which uh, uh, led people to suspect that there wasn't even that risk. But I think it was a proper debate because when you're exploring territory that is far beyond what's already understood, uh, then um, you have to uh, be aware that something unexpected may happen um, and uh, obviously um, the uh, risk you're prepared to take if the whole of the earth is at stake is a very, very small one indeed. So you need to have very great confidence. And so I think it wasn't a trivial issue uh, when people raised this. Uh, I think uh, the uh, issue has now been settled, but it was uh, uh, not inappropriate that this was raised at the time. At the time. So the, the resolution of that kind of problem is, is at a, a very high scientific level, a level of, of high scientific expertise, a consensus that comes out of that? Um, yes, I mean, in that particular case, uh, the most convincing evidence was that uh, nature had already done these experiments. There are particles zooming through space and colliding with each other with much, much greater energy than the LHC can achieve and there have been therefore lots of collisions already in nature which haven't caused a tearing of the fabric of space. So there uh, we, we could uh, point to empirical evidence that uh, there wasn't going to be this risk. Um, but, 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 uh, but, uh, but I think it's not, it's not a trivial um, issue to uh, uh, be concerned about possible catastrophes when you enter some entirely new experimental domain. And it's quite right to be cautious. As in DNA today, as in discussions over uh, CRISPR. And well, well, I mean, for gene drive and things like that, people are right to be very cautious about possible runaway effects, and I'm glad that they are being. Mm -hmm. Yes. Could I ask you about uh, Jan Tallinn? I mentioned it because, he, because I came across him in mm -hmm. an article. Yes. And he had, what seemed to me a bit dismissively, he said, that philosophers <coughs> go off talking nonsense and that mathematical models are necessary to reduce their intuitions uh, to what is testable. Um, is there a place at CSER for the great philosophical and or religious traditions? I think um, that there are issues which um, are relevant to discussing extreme risks. Um, one is... Um, the extent to which we should uh, take into account the uh, rights of future generations and those as yet unborn. Um, and this, this is a, a big philosophical issue. I mean, um, uh, Derek Parfit, of course, wrote, wrote famous papers on this and others did. So, so the issue of the extent to which you discount the uncertain future and take account the uh, uh, welfare of people as yet unborn, that's obviously an ethical uh, question. Um, the other question that comes in is in the context of AI, uh, which is um, the extent to which if we do have machines which achieve more and more human capabilities, which I think we surely will do, because bear in mind we've had machines that can do arithmetic better than us for 40 years, so uh, they will do more and more things better than human beings. But the question is, uh, will we uh, regard them as zombies or will they become conscious? And there's a big philosophical question also about uh, whether um, uh, consciousness is an emergent property beyond a certain level of complexity or whether it is something special to the particular kind of wet hardware that uh, uh, we um, apes and dogs have. And that, that's, a, that's a, bi a big and serious issue. And that makes a big difference to how you react to this. In fact, I remember um, I, I wrote an article in the Financial Times when I talked about the, the far future uh, when um, uh, superhuman machines would have dominated us. And I got um, a sort of bimodal response. Uh, some people thought, um, isn't it awful if all these, these zombies, there's no one there to appreciate the beauty of the universe, etc. And others thought, well, uh, these superhuman entities will have even deeper, uh, fee, deeper ethical senses than us, and this is wonderful. Uh, so the, the issue of whether um, uh, self-awareness and consciousness is uh, an emergent property which machines would have is, I think, a very important question on the interface of uh, 
computer science and philosophy. So um, the, the, the ethics of future generations um, and uh, uh, the um, ethics of intelligent machines are two obvious things. I mean, to, to uh, put it slightly trivially, um, if, uh, if we have a robot which uh, seems rather humanoid, um, then uh, do we have to worry about if, if it's unemployed or bored? Because uh, uh, we do worry about human beings not being able to fulfill their potentialities. And even some animal species, we feel they need to be able to uh, live in their natural way. And so sh are we going to start feeling that way about these machines um, or, or not? And that's an ethical and philosophical question. So I'll just give those two examples of uh, issues on the interface of science and philosophy. Perhaps I can go to one other a question, I think we're pretty much there. Mm -hmm. um, is there an evolutionary selective pressure that can push humans away from the kind of sabotage of civilization uh, you've talked about? Well, one important point is that Darwinian selection doesn't apply to human beings now. Uh, um, we, we keep people alive and, it's, uh, uh, and any selection um, is, um, uh, uh, is artificial and by design, as it were. Um, we, who we keep alive, etc. And of course, there will in future be possible selection uh, if we can, through genetic modification, uh, change uh, people's physique and personality. Uh, so that's going to be a big issue um, if that becomes possible. Uh, what sort of people do we want to? have? Do we want to allow these techniques at all? Um, and what are the qualities that we need to uh, foster? And should this be uh, allowed to a, an elite if it's not available to everyone, etc.? So I think all those issues are going to come up. And uh, uh, as I say, my uh, gut feeling is we should try and constrain and regulate these on Earth. Um, but. Uh, if there are a few crazy people that way on Mars, then wish them good luck in developing into a new species. I've been, I've been uh, for my own um, edification, reading about the, the, the macro and the micro. I've been reading about the extent of the universe, and I've been reading about the latest findings in, yeah. in, in um, you know, the, the collider and what they're finding. Right, yeah, 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 yes. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, the, Yes. What, what we can comprehend is just, just yes, yes, amazing. Yes. But, 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 but of course, the, uh, um, the big thing we don't yet have, as you know, is the theory that unifies the very large and very small. Um, and um, to understand the very early stages of the Big Bang, we need that. Um, to understand the nature of space itself, we need that. Um, and, uh, as you know, string theory and things like yeah. that. They're doing this. But, but, but I think that's the reason it's very difficult um, is that um, most people, people don't know what the theory is, okay? But they agree on one thing, which is that the scale on which it manifests itself is a billion, billion times smaller than the size of an atom. In the sense that um, uh, we, I can't chop up this chair indefinitely, I get down to scale of atoms. Um, the uh, idea is that I can't chop up space indefinitely. You get down to a scale when a single point in space has some complicated turbulent structure, but that scale is 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Okay, and uh, there's an agreement that that's a, a scale because <clears throat> um, that's the scale when uh, gravity and quantum theory merge. Uh, to put it in slightly technical language, it's when it, it, when you have an object whose um, uh, whose Schwarzschild radius, if it's a black hole, is the same as its Compton wavelength from the uncertainty principle. And so everyone agrees that, we, that that's the scale where all this action is going to be. Um, and of course, because that scale is so far from anything we can directly probe, it's going to be a big challenge to uh, develop and indeed test such a theory. And the tests of such a theory will only be indirect because it'll have to depend on uh, calculating consequences uh, which are in the observable world or in the experimental range. Uh, and unless we have those consequences which we can uh, validate, then we will never take these theories seriously. And at the moment, there are lots of theories, but none of them have uh, been battle-tested in that way. But I think the one thing everyone agrees, whether you believe in string theory or loop quantum gravity, etc., is that um, the key scale is this very, very tiny scale. 
And until we uh, um, have a theory that deals with that scale, we won't understand the very early stage of the Big Bang, and we won't understand the nature of space itself at the deepest level. Is that why he called it, uh, Einstein called it spooky? Yes, yes. Well, he thought all, he thought all quantum theory was spooky, though. Yes, he, yes, right. I'm, yes. And indeed it is, and, and I think the, the point is that uh, we shouldn't be surprised it's spooky because our brains evolved. Um, they haven't changed much since our ancestors roamed the African savanna or wherever it was, um, and uh, uh, our intuitions um, are valid for dealing with the everyday world. Okay? And there's no reason at all uh, why our intuition should be able to cope with the micro world of the atom or the cosmic scale. And, uh, and I would say it's rather remarkable that we um, actually have made as much progress as we have with these brains in understanding something about the quantum world um, to the extent that our technology is based on it um, and something about the cosmos. Uh, but I think we must bear in mind that there may be some deeper levels of reality which our brains can't grasp any more than a monkey can grasp quantum theory. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.